Namaskaram. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the uh, 16th paragraph of Nana. Um, in this, uh, this is a very important paragraph because Bhagavan is here removing um, uh, or, or repudiating some very um, prevalent misconceptions. That is, um, generally, uh, they, there's a very widespread belief, not just nowadays, from ancient times, but the, the path of jnana entails um, studying the, um, the <coughs> original source texts of Vedanta, that's the, um, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra and the Bhagavad Gita, and the commentaries upon them, and other related texts. And um, studying such texts is Sravana. Uh, um, <coughs> Sravana literally means hearing, but it, it's used in a broader sense of studying or uh, of, uh, of, of learning. Manana, which means thinking about them, and Nidityasana, which means putting them into practice. A lot of emphasis is given in traditional Vedanta, to studying all these texts and um, and uh, uh, doing what uh, uh, and there are certain prakriyas that is certain set ways of how you must discriminate. That is, we when we start on this path, our aim is to know what we actually are. First, we need to understand what we are not in order to investigate ourselves. We need to understand that we are not this body, the, the prana, the life, the mind, the intellect, the will. We are not any phenomenon. We are not any object. We are the subject. We, we need to understand this before we can take to the inquiry. So there, there are various ways in which we can um, discriminate and understand that uh, we are not this body or mind, uh, any of these five sheaves. Um, these are all these are all preliminaries. Obviously, we need these, but a lot of emphasis is given on these in in the traditional way of of uh, of studying Vedanta. But Bhagavan has put far more emphasis on what is the actual practice. Often, those who have studied Advaita texts for years miss the actual practice. The actual practice is not to study more and more texts without any limit. The actual practice is to turn our attention back within. This is what Bhagavan is emphasizing in this paragraph. Um, why I say this is to put this in context, because it's for a very good reason Bhagavan says this, because many people think that that, that is many people without a subtle understanding they, they know that uh, the, according to the Advaita text, the root problem is avidya or ajnana, ignorance, ignorance of our real nature. So in order to remove this ignorance, we need knowledge. And, but they mistake the knowledge that is required to be knowledge gained from the study of books. It is not, we cannot... We cannot know what we are merely by studying books. We need to turn, the, the purpose of all the, all the Vedantic texts is to turn our attention back towards ourself. Um, to, to, when, for example, when it is uh, the Mahavakyas, all the Mahavakyas are pointing out that what is called Brahman is nothing but ourself. Tattvamasi, uh, you are that. Uh, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Um, I am Atma Brahma. This uh, very self is Brahman. Um, uh, Pragnanam Brahman, uh, pure awareness. That is my, my own awareness. That is Brahman. So all these Mahavakyas are pointing out that what is called Brahman is nothing other than ourself. So when this is pointed out, what should we do? As Bhagavan says in verse um, 32 of um, Uludu Napadu, um, uh, when the Vedas proclaim that is you, uh, or, or you are that, 
um, in Tamil, I do need means that is you, uh, but we can take it out of the way. It amounts to the same thing. Instead of oneself being, knowing oneself as what, thinking I am that, not this, is due to non existence of strength, because that alone is always seated as oneself. What that implies is that when the Vedas say you are that, our response should be to investigate who am I. And by investigating who am I, we should thereby know what we actually are and be what we actually are. That is the, the aim, the purpose of the Mahavakya. But instead of that, if we go on thinking, uh, I am that, I am, I am that, meaning I'm Brahman, not this, not this body or any of these five sheaves, that is, according to Bhagavan, that is just... Uh, <coughs> um, uh, due to, uh, he says, Uran in Mayenal, by, by that is due to uh, non, it literally means non existence of strength. So it's, a, it's due to absence of strength. The strength he's referring to is the strength of, uh, of bhakti and vairagya and the consequent clarity of mind and heart. So we, we need to clearly understand what is the aim of these, of what we are taught in Vedanta, and then. They, 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 when they say, when the Vedas say you are that, our, their aim is that we should investigate who am I. We shouldn't be going on studying more and more or, or going on reasoning why we are Brahman or what is the nature of Brahman and how we are that and uh, why we are not this body. Or, that's, that's all preliminary. Of course, we need to understand that we are that and that we are not this body or anything, a big body or mind. But then merely understanding that is an, is a, is an understanding at the level of intellect, of, of the, of the, at a conceptual level. We, the understanding needs to go much deeper, and we can get that deeper understanding, and that by, only by turning within. The more we turn within, uh, the more ego will subside, and eventually we'll be swallowed by that. So we can be truly, we can be said to have truly understood only when we have been swallowed, when we have ceased to exist as a separate entity and remain only as Brahman. Uh, so, so this is this is what Bhagavan has taught us, and this is what he's emphasizing in this paragraph. Um, so he, Bhagavan is pointing out the the, the error of 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 believing that we can we can know uh, our real nature by endless study of uh, texts or endless reasoning. Sravana manana are necessary. We need to and we need to hear the we need to hear these teachings. We need to um, we need we need to do manana. We need to think deeply about them in order to understand them correctly. But the most important, Savarana and Manana are useful only to the extent to which we, they support us in our practice. If we, if we are just doing Savarana Manana and not turning our attention within, then this is, we, we will gain very little from this. I mean, we, we won't get the, gain the aim of, but what is the purpose of Vedanta? What is the purpose of Advaita philosophy is to make us uh, understand that what is real is only ourselves, not anything else. And therefore, to know what we actually are, we need to investigate ourselves. So th that, that is the context in which Bhagavan has given, uh, uh, gave the teachings that are, uh, that are in this paragraph. Um, what he says in the first sentence is, Enulilum uh, mukti devat ku Man, manate adaka vendum endru sola uh, sola patula padial. That means, since in every text, here every text implies every text of Advaita, because um, it doesn't, not all texts uh, emphasize this, but in all true Advaitic texts, uh, um, uh, it's in, in every true Advaitic text, it is said. But for attaining mukti, it is necessary to make the mind cease. The verb Bhagavan uses here in Tamil is uh, manate adaka. Adaka uh, is, um, is the infinitive form of adaku, which means to bring about the cessation or the subsidence of mind. It can mean 
Um, it can mean curbing the mind, but uh, it, uh, we will attain mukti only when the mind is not just partially curbed, when it is uh, when it, the mind ceases. So the, the sense in which Bhagavan uses this verb here is in the sense of make the mind cease. We need to bring about the cessation of mind. In other words, we need to bring about manonasa. Uh, so this is what is said in uh, every text. Uh, since, since it is said like this in every text, then he goes on. Um, Manonigrahame uh, nulgalin mudivana karatu in the uh, Arindu Konda Pimbu, after knowing uh, that Mano Nigraha alone is the ultimate intention or purpose of such texts, um, uh, Alavindri Padipatal uh, Payanile, there is no benefit uh, by studying texts without limit. In other words, we won't get any benefit by going on and on studying. We need to put it into practice is the implication. Um, th he uses here one Sanskrit term, mano nigraham. Mano, uh, uh, mano means, uh, refers to mind. Uh, that is, manas in, a, in compound becomes mano. Uh, nigraha means curbing or restraining, or in this context, it means destruction. That is, the, the practice is to curb the, the mind. Uh, the aim is to destroy the mind. So uh, the purpose of all these texts, the ultimate intention of all these texts, is that we should bring about the uh, destruction of the mind. And we should bring about manonasa. Um, so having understood this, there's no benefit in going on and on studying texts without limit. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't study. For example, Bhagavan has given us the essence of all of Advaita philosophy in just a few texts, like Nana, Uludunaptu, Upadesha India, and a few other, Anmavidde, um, Ekama uh, Panchakam, and Aranacha Stutapanchakam. Here, Bhagavan has given us the very essence of, uh, of uh, the, the very essence of all Advaitic texts. So if we've studied and understood Bhagavan's teachings, we don't need to study other texts because. Bhagavan has presented the whole thing in a very, in a very clear, simple, and simple manner, and in a very refined manner. That is the, the clarity of understanding that we can gain by studying Bhagavan's tech, uh, Bhagavan's teachings. We cannot easily gain, even if we study hundreds and hundreds of books or of other texts on Advaita, because Bhagavan has 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 distilled the very the very essential principles of Advaita, and he's expressed them in a in a very new and fresh way. And what is particularly um, what, what is very special about Bhagavan's teachings is the emphasis he puts on practice. Not only has he emphasized practice, but he has presented the teachings in an extremely practical manner. For example, one thing that Bhagavan has, has made clear to us is the nature of ego. The nature of ego, ego is the, the false awareness, I am this body. That is, as ego, we are always aware of ourselves as I am this body, in which the term body means not just the physical form, it means all the five sheaves. Um, as Bhagavan says in verse 5 of Uludu Napadu, uh, Udul Pancha Koza Udu, the body is a form of five sheaves. So uh, this this false awareness that this bundle of five sheaths is, uh, is ourself, that is ego. But they have my buddhi, that is ego. Um, the, so the one, one characteristic of ego is that as ego, we are always aware of ourselves as I am this body. In other words, we have limited ourselves within to the extent of this body. Uh, that is one uh, feature of ego. The other feature, essential feature of ego is that the nature of ego is always to be aware of things other than itself. That is, as soon as we limit ourselves with this body, there seem to be things other than ourselves. So ego is always aware of things other than itself. It's always grasping things other than itself. This is what Bhagavan um, describes in verse uh, 25 of Uludunapadu, in which he describes ego as uh, 
a formless phantom. It's formless because it's got no form of its own, and it's a phantom because it's got no substance of its own. It borrows its substance, its existence and its awareness, from Satchit. And it borrows its form from the body, but it is neither Satchit nor is it the body, as he says in the previous verse, in verse 24. Because, the, the, as he says in verse 24, the body is, does not say I, by, which is a metaphorical way of saying the body is not aware of itself as I, because the body, all the five sheaths, they are Jada. They have got no awareness of their own, as Bhagavan points out in verse 22 of uh, Upadesh India. So they are Jada. So since the body is, has no awareness, it, it, it cannot, it's not aware of itself as I. And Satchit doesn't rise. Satchit, the nature of Satchit is just to be, not to rise or to do anything. But in between these two, uh, one thing I rises as the extent of a body. This is ego. So Ego is neither the body nor is it Satchit, but it borrows the properties of both. Like Satchit, it's aware of itself as I, and but it, it it's not aware of itself as just as I as as just I am. It's aware of itself as I am this body. So it's limited itself to a form of the body. Um, that's why Bhagavan calls in verse twenty five. He describes ego as a formless phantom. And then he, what he says about this formless phantom, he begins the verse by saying, uh, Urupatri uh, undam, grasping form, it comes into existence. Urupatri nikkum, grasping form, it stands. Urupatri undu mika ongum, grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes abundantly. Uru vittu urupatram, leaving form, it grasps form. If it leaves one form, it grasps another form. The, the implication of the, these, uh, these sentences is that grasping form is the very nature of ego. Form here means anything other than ourself, because ego is a formless phantom, so all forms are other than ourself. Forms doesn't just mean physical forms, it means forms of any kind. In, in other words, both all phenomena, whether uh, mental or seemingly physical, all phenomena are forms. Um, so uh, be attending to, to any form, to any phenomenon, or uh, being aware of any phenomenon, that is what Bhagavan calls grasping form. So it's the very nature of ego to grasp form. But then he says in the next sentence of verse 25, Tedinal otum pidicum, if sought, it takes flight. What that uh, implies is if ego, instead of grasping things other than itself, if it tries to grasp itself, if it tries to know who am I, if it tries to investigate itself, that's what he means by if sought, uh, it takes flight. In other words, it, 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 uh, it runs away. Why? Because we seem to be ego only so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves. If instead of attending to other things, we turn our attention back to try to see who am I, Ego will, will, will subside and dissolve back into its source because it's got nothing to grasp on, to hold on to. It subsides. And it, we seem to be ego only so long as we're grasping things other than ourselves, only so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves, we seem to be ego. If we attend to ourselves, there's no such thing as ego to be found. So ego seems to exist, we, or we seem to be ego, only so long as we're attending to other things. So in this way, Bhagavan has revealed to us what is the nature of ego. So from this we can understand, attending to, so long as we're attending to anything other than ourself, we are nourishing and sustaining ego. As he says, Uru, um, Urupatri undu mika ongum, grasping and feeding on form. So by attending to things other than ourselves, by holding things other than ourselves, we are thereby nourishing and sustaining this appearance of ego. But if we turn back to look at ego, there's no such thing to be found. It subsides and dissolves back into its source. And what remains is just pure being, which is our real nature, pure being, pure awareness. So since such is the nature of ego, we can never know what we actually, and so long as we are aware of ourselves as ego, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are, because ego is a false awareness of ourselves. So what is called uh, avidya or ajnana, 
according to Bhagavan, is nothing but ego. It is ego that that is the very nature of ego is to be aware of itself as something, something other than itself. So long as we're aware of ourselves as anything other than ourselves, so long as we're aware of ourselves as I am this or I am that, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. What we actually are is just the pure awareness I am, the pure adjunctless awareness I am. Whereas ego is the adjunct mixed awareness. Uh, so the same, there's only one I, but that I, when mixed with adjuncts, is called ego. When it remains as it is, as just pure being, pure awareness, that is our real nature. So it, it, we cannot know what we actually are without eradicating ego. And ego is nourished and sustained by attending to things other than ourselves. So as long as we continue studying texts or attending to anything other than ourselves, we cannot bring about the dissolution of ego. And then without bringing about the dissolution of ego, how can we be as we actually are? This is what Bhagavan says in verse um, 27 of Uludhanapadu. He says... Um, the state is nanu diado ulla nile, namaduvai ulla nile. The state in which one exists without I rising is the state in which we exist as that. And then he goes on to say, nan udicum tanum ade nadamal, tan udia tan irape savadu evan. That, that means without investigating the place where I rises, the place where I rises, here place doesn't literally mean a place in time and space. <laughs> place here means, uh, he's, Bhagavan used the word place often in a metaphorical sense. What is, from what does this ego rise? It only rises from ourselves, from our real nature, from what we actually are. So the place where ego rises is our own real nature, that fundamental awareness I am. That is what Bhagavan describes here as the place where I rises. Um, so without investigating the place where I rises, how to reach the annihilation of oneself in which I does not rise. So the only way to bring about the dissolution of ego is to investigate what we actually are, to investigate our fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. That is the place from which I arises. And then he goes on, without reaching, implying without reaching that annihilation of, our, of self, say how to stand in the state of oneself in which oneself is that. So the, the, the Mahavakya say you are that. When they say you are that, in order to experience ourselves as that, we need to remain in the state in which we don't rise as ego. So long as we rise as ego, of course, we are always that. But so long as we rise as ego, we are not aware of ourselves as that. We are aware of ourselves as this body. So it's necessary to bring about the annihilation of ego. And to bring about the annihilation of ego, it's necessary to investigate ourselves. So merely by studying texts, we cannot know what we actually are. So this is what this is, as I say, this is what Bhagavan is emphasizing here. So when we know that, when, the, when all the texts say that we must bring about the, the, the uh, cessation of mind, we must make the mind cease, and knowing that cessation of the mind is the ultimate aim of all such texts, there's no benefit of going on studying and studying and studying because we're continuing to attend to things other than ourselves. So we, when we study, we should study in a, when we uh, when we study the text, we should understand the intention of the text. We shouldn't just take the, the words and go on studying and studying. It's, it's not a me a dwight is not a mere philosophy. Yes, it, it is a very deep and very profound philosophy, but it's a philosophy with a purpose. That purpose is we should bring about the uh, dissolution of mind. And how to bring about the dissolution of mind? Only by investigating ourselves. As Bhagavan goes on to say in the next sentence, um, in the second sentence of this paragraph, he says, um, it's, it's, this is a difficult sentence to translate exactly because it's put in a very... Um, in a very uh, that if the way Bhagavan expresses himself in Tamil, it's firstly the, the sentence structure is almost impossible to put in, in English. There's no exact equivalent in English. And secondly, Bhagavan is, 
he he says the most in the fewest words. So what he says here is, manam adakavadaku tane ya endru vicharika vendame. That means for making the mind cease, it is necessary to investigate oneself who. Uh, uh, that ya endru, uh, that means as who. Uh, what that implies is we need to investigate ourselves to see who we are. That, that is, when we're investigating ourselves, what is the aim of our investigation? To see what we actually are, to know what we actually are. So that's what is implied by Yar Andrew. So we need to investigate what we are. We need to investigate ourselves to see what we are or who we are. Um, and then this is where the sentence becomes difficult to translate in English because alamo is a adversative conjunction for which there's no um, exact equivalent in English. It means something like accept. So accept that it's necessary to do this. Um, it, then he asks a question. Um, to bring out the sense of that accept, I've translated as instead but instead of doing so. That's the implication of this alamo. So it's necessary for one to investigate oneself, but instead of doing so, epidi nul galil vicharipadu. That literally means how investigating in text, what that implies is how can we know what we actually are by investigating in text? So we, we cannot bring about the cessation of mind or we cannot see what we actually are merely by investigating in text. In order to in see what we actually are, we need to investigate ourselves, not investigate the text. Um, so merely going on studying texts without limit is not going to get us very far. Okay, we, we, a certain understanding may bring about a certain... Um, a certain detachment, so we are able to, we, we have a slightly different attitude to life, but still we're not getting, we're not really solving the problem, because so long as ego remains, uh, we, we are still in ignorance. Ego can never know what it actually is. When we are investigating ourselves, our aim is to know what we actually are. Who is investigating? It is ego investigating itself to know what it actually is. So ego must aim to know what it actually is. But as soon as we as ego know ourselves as we actually are, we thereby cease to be ego because ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself. When we're aware of ourselves as we actually are, the ego is thereby dissolved. So our aim is to know ourselves as we actually are, because by knowing ourselves as we actually are, we thereby bring about the dissolution of ego. And since ego is avidya, since ego is ignorance, it is only by bringing about the dissolution of ego that we can know that, that uh, we can know ourselves as we actually are. It, so long as we continue studying, who is it who is studying? It's only we as ego who are studying. So whatever knowledge we as ego gain cannot enable us to know what we actually are. I mean, when we as ego know what we actually are by turning within and investigating ourselves, we will thereby cease to be ego. And what we actually are, that alone will remain. Um, then in the next sentence, he he. <clears throat> he emphasizes the same idea. He says, Tane, uh, Tanudeya, Nyana, Kala, Kanal, Tane, Arya, Vendum. That means it is necessary to know oneself only by one's own eye of Nyana. Nyana come means the eye of Nyana. Uh, nyana here means awareness. So it's we ourselves need to be aware of ourselves as we actually are. We can't, it's not by merely by uh, studying books and get, learning more information and getting a deeper understanding of this philosophy. This isn't true knowledge. We need to, the, the eye of awareness is that inner uh, clarity of self-awareness, I am. So it's only by turning within and seeing ourselves as we actually are that we can know what we actually are. And then he uses an analogy to drive home this point. Raman, uh, Tanne, uh, tan Raman and Draria, Kanadi Vendama. Here, Raman is just a, a random name. 
uh, like you can say John or Mary or something. It's just a random name. It's not referring to any particular person. Um, so, so Raman here means a person implies a person called Raman. Does Raman need a mirror to know himself as Raman? So here, what Bhagavan implies by this analogy, all the texts, all the Upanishads, uh, Brahma Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, and all the commentaries on them and everything, these are all like mirrors. They, 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 they're showing us what we are. But to see what we actually are, we can't, merely by looking in the mirror, we, 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 don't, we cannot know ourselves just by looking in a mirror. In order to know what we actually are, we need to look within ourselves. So we, the, the texts are useful to point us in the right direction, but they're useless if we don't go in the direction in which they point us. The direction in which they point us is, you are that. So if I am that, then who am I? We need to turn our attention back within. Um, so this is what Bhagavan is emphasizing here. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be constantly depending on these texts which are outside ourselves. We need to search within ourselves. And then he goes on in the next sentence, again, to emphasize the same thing. He says, Tan panchakosan galul irupadu. Tan means oneself. Um, it, it, sometimes this is translated as the self is within the five sheaths. But tan here um, simply means oneself. It... Uh, we, Bhagavan often uses the word tan. Sometimes he's referring to our real nature. Sometimes he's referring to ego. Sometimes he's just referring to ourself in general. Um, so we need to understand from the context. But here, tan just means oneself. Um, oneself is within the five sheaves. Um, here, oneself means what is it that is within the five sheaves? Um, that is, the sheaths are called sheaths because they seemingly cover. So they seemingly cover our real nature. But we cannot say that our real nature is limited within the five sheaths because everything appears within us. So um, but the sense in which Bhagavan says oneself is within the five sheaths, so long as we are aware of ourselves as I am this body consisting of these five sheaths. We seem to be within this, within these five sheaths. So we who seem to be within the five sheaths are ego. But it, it's only by in, ego investigating itself. It's only by we investigating ourselves who now seem to be ego that we can know what we actually are. Um, that is, so long as we mistake the, uh, the snake, sorry, so long as we mistake the rope to be a snake, we have to look at the snake very carefully. If we look at the snake very carefully, we'll see it's just a rope. So um, it's e in a certain sense, it is ego that we are investigating. But we're in investig when we're looking at the, the snake, what we're actually looking at is rope. When we're, investi when we're investigating ego, what we're actually investigating is our real nature. So uh, when he, Bhagavan says oneself is within uh, the five sheaths, oneself here is, um, if you, uh, you better not to analyze it at all. I mean, it's not necessary, but if you want to say what is this, what is the self that, that is within the five sheaths, it's only ego because our real nature is, uh, is untouched by the five sheaths, it's unaffected by the five sheaths. So now we seem to be within these five sheaths. So it's within us, it's within these five sheaths that we need to investigate ourselves. In other words, we need to stop looking outwards. We need to look back within. Outwards means at anything other than ourselves. So all the five sheaths are outward, are, are things exterior to ourselves, outside ourselves. Whereas we, are, what is inside, is only ourselves. So we need to look within ourselves. Um, uh, another way of explaining this. Uh, oneself, what Bhagavan means here by saying oneself is within the five sheaths. Now we experience ourselves as ego. Ego is the false awareness. I am this, uh, I am this body consisting of five sheaths. But what is within is only that I am. That is what we actually are. 
but obviously all these things are within our hand. So we, we, we need to understand the sense in which what Bhagavan says it. So here we need not analyze whether oneself is referring to ego or to our real nature. If we look at it, view it in one way, we can say, yes, it's referring to ego. If we view it another way, it's referring to our real nature. But analyzing it is really not necessary here. What Bhagavan, is, what Bhagavan is saying here is something very simple. One self is within the five sheaths. Uh, the five sheaths means um, physical body, um, the anamaya kosha, the life or uh, the pranamaya kosha, the mind or manamaya kosha, the intellect or vijnanamaya kosha, and the will or anandamaya kosha. So we now seem to be covered by all these things. So we are within these things. We, we, know, we cannot find ourselves by looking outside. We need to look back within. Um, and then in the next sentence, he says, Nulgalo uh, avetriku veliyil irupave, whereas texts are outside them. That is all books outside these five sheets. So if we are, if we, so long as we are studying texts, we are looking outwards. We are looking away from ourselves. In order to know what we actually are, we need to stop looking outwards. We need to look back within to see what we actually are. Um, then in the next sentence. He therefore draws a conclusion. Ahaya, therefore, Pancha Kozangaleum Niki, Vicharika Vendia Tane, Nulgalil, Vicharipadu, Vine. What that means, literally, uh, therefore, investigating in text or in, investigating in text oneself or investigating oneself in text. Uh, oneself whom it is necessary to investigate, setting aside um, all the five sheaths is useless. That is, so, so long as we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, we cannot know what we actually are. So to know what we actually are, we need to turn our attention back within, away from these five sheaths, to who am I? We, we're turning our attention away from five sheaths. We're not looking outwards, we're looking back within. When we, to the extent to which we turn within, we are thereby um, uh, setting aside or excluding or removing or giving up or separating ourselves from the five sheaths. So long as we're looking outwards, it's only when we identify with the five sheaths that we are aware of um, the world and all the Vedantic books and whatever other philosophies and everything. It's only when we first we have to identify ourselves with the body in order to be aware of the world. And only when we're aware of the world are we aware of, um, of uh, all these uh, books. The purpose of these books, the, the Advaita books, is to turn our attention back within, not to to say, go on, uh, come on, continue studying me without limit. Where all the texts are pointing at what we actually are. Know yourself. So we have to turn back within. So, um, uh, <clears throat> as I say, this is, again, like one of the earlier sentences, it, this is a difficult sentence to, Bhagavan has expressed it in a very compact way. But what it implies here is, we need to investigate ourselves by setting aside the five sheaths. In other words, turning our attention away from these five sheaths, back towards one, who am I who mistake these five sheaths to be I? So we, we, are, we are turning our attention away from the five sheaths, back towards the I that mistakes itself to be these five sheaths. So this is what we need to investigate. But how can we investigate um, and know ourselves by uh, in, in books, because the books are all outside. So long as we're studying the books, we're looking outside, we're looking away from ourselves. This is the point Bhagavan is uh, emphasizing here. So we, it's only when we identify ourselves with these five sheep, with body, my, uh, life, mind, intellect, and will, but we can study books. But so long as we are studying, so, so long as we are studying books, we are, we are sustaining this, uh, mistaken awareness of ourself, I am this body consisting of five sheaths. So in order to know what we actually are, we need to set aside these five sheaths by turning our attention back within 
and know ourselves within ourselves. It's only by looking within, by attending to ourselves, that we can know ourselves. We cannot know ourselves by looking outwards at books. That, that this, this is the implication here. Um, so Bhagavan is very, very forceful here. Bhagavan is saying, stop looking out, look back within. That, that is the, as he began this paragraph, what is the purpose of all these Vedantic texts that we're studying? They're all to tell us, but we have to bring about the, um, the, the, um, the dissolution of the mind, the, the, the cessation of the mind. How to bring about the cessation of mind? We need to investigate ourselves. Where to investigate ourselves? Not in books, only within ourselves. We need to attend to ourselves to see what we actually are. We cannot see what we actually are by looking in the mirror. The books are just like a mirror. Um, they're telling us about ourselves. They're describing ourselves. They're saying you're Satchidananda Brahman and everything. But merely understanding we are Satchidananda Brahman is not experiencing ourselves as such. In order to experience ourselves as such, we need to investigate ourselves. Um, then in the next sentence, Bhagavan gives a, a very nice definition of mukti. Bandatil uh, irakum tanya endru vicharitu tanyatata sarupate terindu kolvade mukti. That means uh, investigating who is oneself who is in bondage, knowing one's yatata sarupa, one's actual own nature, alone is mukti, alone is liberation. Um, because he, he he began this uh, by, by, by this paragraph by talking, saying, for attaining mukti, all the texts say that for attaining mukti, it's necessary to bring about the cessation of mind. So, what is mukti, and how how can we attain mukti? The, the answer is given here. We need to investigate ourselves. Now, the why do we want? Why are we seeking mukti? Why are we seeking liberation? Because we now seem to be in bondage. What is the bondage? Bondage is nothing but ego, as Bhagavan says in verse twenty-four of Uludunapadu. Uh, that false eye that rises between the body and satchit, namely ego, that itself is bondage. Why is it bondage? Because we are, we have, as ego, we always limit ourselves as a body. So we are bound within the limitations of the body. The body is limited in time. It was born one day, it's going to die one day. So it, it, it's not everlasting. It's limited in time. It's limited in place. I am here, not there. So we've limited ourselves in time and space. And it's also limited uh, in, uh, that is, in, in, in a Dvaita philosophy, when they're talking about limitation, they often talk about limitation in kala, desa, vastu. Kala means time, desa means uh, place or space, vastu means when if I am this body, then I'm not this microphone, I'm not this uh, PC, I'm not this table, I'm not this chair. So we, 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 when we limit ourselves as one thing, that's what bastu means here. Here, bastu is used in the sense of a thing. When we limit ourselves as one thing, we thereby become, uh, we thereby uh, all other, we, we thereby limit ourselves. If, because I'm this body, I'm not this microphone. If I was this microphone, I wouldn't be this body because they're two separate things. I can't be more than one thing. So if I'm this body, then I'm not the microphone, I'm not the, I'm not the, um, any other object. So we we have we limit ourselves by rising as ego. Uh, so that limitation within time, space, and vastu that is uh, that is bondage. So to be free of this limitation, we need to know what we actually are, because what we actually are is ever liberated, as Bhagavan uh, uh, makes clear in Uludunapadu and other texts. So what we actually are is ever liberated. So. To know what to 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 be liberated, we need all we need to do is to know what we actually are. And how can we know what we actually are? By investigating ourselves, by investigating who am I, who am in bondage. Um, here, when I translated this in English, uh, I put by investigating. There's no, it's not actually. Bowen doesn't actually literally say here by investigating, but I put by there in order to make the um, 
in, in order to come a little bit closer to the implied meaning of uh, Tamil, because uh, in English, when we say investigating and knowing, we use, uh, we use the form investigating uh, or knowing, that is, uh, these can be either participles in English or they can be nouns, they, they can be verbal nouns. In this case, um, in Tamil, uh, vicharitu is an adverbial participle. So the, the clause, uh, bandatil irukum tanya endru vicharitu, is an adverbial clause, investigating oneself who is in bondage. That is an adverbial clause. Whereas tanyatata uh, sarupate terindu kolvade, this is a, a noun phrase, terindu kolvade is a verbal noun. Um, technically, it's, a, it's called a participial noun. It's a particular type of verbal. There are various types of verbal noun in, uh, in Tamil, but he, he, it, in effect, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a verbal noun. So here, knowing one's, yata, knowing in, knowing one's yatata swarupa, that is the subject. That is a, a verbal noun. Whereas investigating oneself, who is in bondage, that is an adverbial clause. So the... The, the main, the subject of the sentence is knowing one's real nature is uh, bondage. How are we to know our real nature? He gives an adverbial clause. So though he doesn't say by investigating, that's what is implied here. He, he simply says investigating oneself, knowing one's uh, real nature. So um, but in Tamil, it's clear because the the, the um, Adverbial participles have a different form to verbal nouns, whereas in English we use the same form. Knowing could be either, depending on the context in which we used it in English, it can either be a participle or it can be a, a verbal noun. Um, so in this case, the, um, the investigating is a participle, an adverbial participle, whereas knowing is, is a, a verbal noun. So I, I say that just to... To, to make it clear why I use this word by. It's not, it's not actually expressed there, but it is implied there. That is this adverbial clause, the purpose of the adverbial clause, investigating oneself who is in bondage, is to show how are we to know our real nature, only by investigating ourselves. So though by is not, is not there, is not explicit in Tamil, it is implied there in the sentence structure. Um, so that's a very nice definition of, of liberation. What is liberation? It's knowing one's real nature. How is one to know one's real nature? Only by investigating who am I, who am I in bondage. Um, and then the next sentence is an extremely important sentence because here Bhagavan gives a very clear definition of what he means by Atma Vichara. And there's a reason why he gives this definition here, which I'll explain. I'll first give the, explain the definition. What he says is, Sada kalamum, that means always, at all times. Manate atma vil ve tirbadaku, uh, 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 keeping the mind uh, uh, fixed on atma, on oneself. Atma uh, vicharam um, indrupaya. Um, what that means is the name atma vichara. Uh, there's no verb here, but the, um, it's implied by the sentence structure. In English, we, the, the verb we would use in such a context is refers. So the name Atmavichara refers to what? Uh, only, to, um, uh, the, only to always keeping the mind fixed on oneself. Um, that implies it, it refers only to this practice of always keeping our mind fixed on ourselves. Um, the Vaitiripatiku means uh, keeping fixed on um, uh, or keeping fixed. Uh, atma vil is a locative uh, case form of Atma. Um, so it means it can mean in oneself, but in English, when we talk about, we don't talk about keeping the mind fixed in something, we talk about keeping it fixed on something. If you keeping your mind fixed on something is another way of saying attending to it. If, you, if you've got your mind fixed on a certain thing, um, 
you, you're, you're attending to that. You're attending to it to the exclusion of all else. You're focusing only on that thing. So what Bhagavan clearly implies in this sentence is that what is Atmavichara is nothing but being self-attentive. Keeping our attention fixed on ourselves, that is Atmavichara. That's the implication here. He uses the word, he says, fixed Atmavil. Atmavil means uh I say we could, it's a locative case form, so we could take it in oneself, but to be, uh, it's more natural in English to say on oneself. So keeping the mind fixed on oneself. Again, here, people often translate the word Atma as the self with a capital S. But here, Bhagavan isn't, the word Atma in Sanskrit is the same as, is very similar to the word Tan, the Bhagavan often uses in Tamil. It means just oneself. In some contexts, it can mean ourself as we actually are. In other words, it can mean our, it can refer to our real nature. In other contexts, it can refer to ego or ourself as we now seem to be. But here, it's we need not we need not say whether uh, we, we we need not um, specify whether Atma here is referring to ego or to our real nature. Just as if we if Bhagavan tells us if we if we see a rope and mistake it to be a snake, um, Bhagavan will say, look at it very carefully and you'll see it's not, a, it's not a snake, it's just a rope. But if we then ask Bhagavan, Bhagavan, am I to see the, the snake or the rope? Seeing that we are not understanding, he'll say, oh no, just look carefully at the snake. But whether, you're, whether you think you're looking at the snake or at the rope, it's the same thing. There's only one thing there. There are not two things, one snake and one rope. There's only one thing. The, the, we, we see the snake and we mistake it to be a rope. Likewise, there are no two eyes or two selves, one, one big self with a capital S, uh, the real self, and one uh, uh, small self. No, there's only one self. When we are aware of ourself as just I am, that is our real nature. When we are aware of ourself as I am this or I am that, that is ego, as Bhagavan often said. So it's the adjunct mixed awareness, uh, 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 adjunct mixed awareness I is ego. Adjunct free awareness I is our real nature. But it's only one eye, there aren't two, two eyes there. So all, all we need, we need to fix our attention on ourselves. The definition that Bhagavan gives here of for Mukti, uh, for, sorry, for Atma Vichara, is very, very close to a definition, uh, well, not a definition, to what Krishna says in, um, in verse, I think it's chapter 6, verse 25 of, um, of um, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, in, in that verse, he says, uh, Atma samstam manakritva, keep the mind fixed on, one, on yourself. Do not think of anything else. Bhagavan has translated this verse into, um, into Tamil, in Bhagavad Gita Saram. It is verse uh, 27. And in the, 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 the last line of the Sanskrit verse, Atma Samsam Manakritva Nakinchitapi Chintayat, is the last two lines in the Tamil verse, in which Bhagavan says, Chittate Anma vil se tiduka. Fix the mind on Atma, on oneself. Matredavam. Itaneum enidade. Do not think, even in the slightest, of anything else. That doesn't mean that we should be trying not to think of other things, because if we attend only to ourselves, we. To the extent to which we're attending to ourselves, we're not attending to other things. So, um, we that 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 uh, chintapi chintayet. Do not think of anything else. Is emphasizing the how keenly we must be focused on on uh, we, how keenly we must focus our attention or fix our uh, keep fix our mind on ourselves. We must fix it so firmly. But thereby, there's no room for any other thought to arise, because other thoughts can arise only if we attend to them. If we're attended with, uh, with one-pointed attention to ourselves, um, then there's no room for other thoughts to arise. So what Krishna says in Gita, Atma Samstam Manakritva, 
Yeah. Keep uh, a fixed for mind on, on, on yourself, on uh, Atma, is exactly what Bhagavan is saying here, except here Bhagavan is, is referring to the same practice, but he says this alone is Atma Vichara. This is, this is what the word Atma Vichara means. It is only keeping the mind always fixed on oneself. In other words, always being self-attentive, that is what is meant by Atma Vichara. So uh, people people have misunderstood Bhagavan's teachings in so many ways. Some people think that Atma Vichara means asking the question, who am I? Or to whom are these thoughts? But though Bhagavan sometimes describe the practice using questions, those questions are only pointers. What is it we're to investigate? We're to investigate what we are, who, who we are. We're to, in fact, it's just a way of uh, pointing to us and particularly this point to, to whom are these, to whom does all this appear? Whatever may appear, it appears to whom? Only to me. So this is a, this is a very nice clue Bhagavan has given us to turn our attention back to ourselves. But what is, what is Atma Vichara? Not, sometimes we, some people find it helpful to ask these questions occasionally. Who am I or to whom are these thoughts? It may be useful to ask those questions as an aid, but merely asking the questions is not Atma Vichara. Atma Vichara is keeping the mind fixed on oneself. So if, uh, if asking those questions helps us to turn our attention back to ourselves, then they are useful. But if we just go on repeating the question, we miss the point. It's not that we, Bhagavan didn't ask us to question who am I, he asked us to investigate who am I. We need to investigate ourselves, means we need to attend to ourselves. We need to look at ourselves very closely to see what we actually are. Um, but the main reason why Bhagavan included, uh, I mean, this definition of Atma Vichara, he could have included anywhere in Nana. But why did he include it in this paragraph? Because the term Atma Vichara has been grossly misunderstood um, by the vast majority of Advaitins. In, if, if you go to traditional teachers of Advaita and ask about Atma Vichara, they'll point to you all the prakriyas. You can do Atma Vichara by uh, Drikdrisya Vivaka, distinguishing the seer from the seen. You can do Atma Vichara by analyzing the three states, uh, waking, dream, and sleep. You can an do Atma Vichara by uh, discriminating between what is changing and what is unchanging, what is eternal and what is ephemeral. These are all intellectual analysis, but they're useful as preliminaries to help us to understand what we are not. Anything that changes is obviously not ourself because we remain the same. Anything that appears and disappears is obviously not ourself because we always exist and we are always aware of our existence. So th these prakriyas that are taught in Advaita, they are useful preliminaries, but they are not the Atma Vichara. You can't do Atma Vichara simply by um, analyzing why I'm not this body, why I'm not this mind. That is... These prakriyas are to help us to understand what we are not. But why, why do we need to understand what we are not? Because we need to investigate ourselves. So long as I take myself to be this body, if I'm told to investigate myself or to attend to myself, I will investigate only the body. So we need to understand we're not the body, we're not the mind, we're not the intellect, we're not the will, we're not any of these five sheaths. We are that which is aware of all these things. They are all objects. We are the subject. This is the Drikdrisya Vivaka, the, the distinguishing the, 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 the subject from the object, the seer from, the, from what is uh, uh, seen, the perceiver from what is perceived, and knower from what is known. This is necessary. This is a necessary preliminary that we need to analyze in this way to understand what we are not in order to investigate ourselves, but merely understanding what we are not and, and uh, studying these prakriyas and thinking about them and um, discussing them, this is not Atma Vichara. Atma Vichara is only when having understood that we are not this body or mind or anything else, we are, we are nothing but that which is always shining in our heart as I, turning our attention back within to see what we actually are, that alone is Atma Vichara. So keeping the mind... Fixed not on 
on not even we shouldn't even be thinking I am Brahman because that that is a, this is another thing be, um, another misunderstanding uh, many Advaitins believe after doing all these kriyas understanding you're not uh, you're not any of these five sheets then you need to meditate I am Brahman because what we act well, if I'm not any of these then what am I I'm Brahman so if I continue meditating I am Brahman that is, the thought I am Brahman is just a thought. It's something other than ourselves. So long as we're thinking I am Brahman, our attention is on something other than ourselves. We shouldn't be attending to the mere thought who um, I am Brahman. We shouldn't even be thinking, attending to the thought who am I. We should be attending to ourselves. But that is, when we are told you are Brahman, our, our attention should turn away from the idea of Brahman back towards ourselves. So Bhagavan is emphasizing here, vichara is nothing but fixing the mind on oneself, being keenly self-attentive, that alone is vichara. And then in the next um, paragraph, in the, sorry, next sentence, he says, dhyanamo tanne satchidananda brahma maha bhavipadu. Uh, dhyanamo, the O on the end, uh, it implies whereas, that is, he said what actually vichara is, whereas dhyana, meditation, is uh, a bhavipadu. Bhavipadu means thinking or imagining. Um, so he, uh, that is, Bhagavan is here talking about uh, what is sometimes referred to as soham bhavana, the, the, the thinking oneself, I am, I am here, I am here, I am here, or I am Brahman. So, what Bhagavan says, jnana is, um, is imagining or considering oneself to be Satchitananda Brahma. That is Brahman, which is Satchitananda, which is uh, uh, Sat means uh, pure being, uh, Chit means pure awareness, uh, Ananda means pure happiness. So uh, what we actually are is only Brahman. So thinking that, is, uh, that is dhyana, but that is not vichara. Vichara is keeping the mind fixed on ourselves. Um, but again, he, here, here Bhagavan uses dhyana in, in the sense in which is usually understood, that is thinking I am Brahman or something. In, but in other contexts, for example, in the 10th paragraph of Nana, Bhagavan used the term swarupa dhyana. When Bhagavan is using Dhyana in that context, when he's talking about Swarupa Dhyana, Swarupa means our own real nature. So meditating on our own real nature is, is, a, is another way of describing the practice of self-investigation. In other words, being self-attentive is what he means by Swarupa Dhyana. But here he's, the Dhyana he's talking about here is what people often uh, believe. But what is Brahma Dhyana? How to meditate on Brahman? By thinking... Uh, what is Brahman? Brahman is I. So to, in order to think of, of Brahman, I must meditate. I am Brahman. I am Brahman. I am Brahman. That is that Bhagavan has said uh, in in um, in Uludu Napadu, as I say in verse thirty two, um, when he said, that "What is the purpose? Why the Vedas proclaim you are that?" In verse thirty two of Uludu Napadu, he says. Um, Thinking I am that, not this, in other words, thinking I am Brahman, not this body or mind, is due to non-existence of strength. Um, because that uh, Brahman alone always is always seated as oneself. In fact, it's, it's useful to consider all, there are three, four verses in Uludunapdu in which Bhagavan refers to, um, to, uh, I am that, or, or, or in verse 27, which I read earlier, he says, he's the, um, the state in which one exists without I rising, I was without rising as ego, is the state in which we exist as that. So what, it, um, um, uh, if we want to be that, if we want to, that, that here refers to Brahman. So the state in which one exists without I rising is the state in which we exist as that. Without investigating the place where I rises, how to reach the annihilation of oneself in, in which I does not rise. And without reaching that annihilation, without the, the annihilating this ego, say how to stand in the state of oneself in which one is that. 
So if we want to be that, if you want to be Brahman, we shouldn't be meditating, I am Brahman, we should be investigating ourselves and thereby bringing about the annihilation of ego. Only when ego is annihilated do we actually experience ourselves as that. That's verse 27. And then in verse 29, he says, uh, not saying I by mouth, investigating by an inward sinking mind where one rises as I alone is the path of knowledge. Path of knowledge means the path of vichara in, by implication. Um, so how do, how do we, what, what is the path of, uh, of knowledge as he, the jnana nari, as he describes it here? Um, uh, um, firstly, we shouldn't, he says, nanendru vayal naviladu. Um, that means uh, not, uh, not saying I by mouth. In other words, we shouldn't be merely repeating or even we shouldn't even be thinking the word I. Well, we need to investigate what we actually are. We shouldn't be just, we shouldn't meditate on the word I. We should meditate on what that word refers to. Um, then he says, Ul al manatal, by an inward sinking mind, nan endru engu undum. From where did this eye sprout? From where does it rise? Uh, but from where does the ego rise? It rises only from ourselves. That implies ourselves. So, uh, investigating where it rises, in anadale means in investigating where it rises, jnana nariyan, that is the path of knowledge. So, um, not saying I by mouth, investigating by an inward sinking mind, where one rises as I, alone is the path of knowledge. Then he says, Andri, which means accept, but here in this context, we can take it as instead. Instead, um, uh, uh, Andru idu nan aduam, uh, Andru unnal tuneyam. Uh, uh, instead, thinking not this, I am that. That implies thinking I am not this, meaning the body, I am that, Brahman, um, is an aid, Tune, he says. Adu vichara mama, can it be a vichara? So, merely thinking I am that, maybe an aid, that is, if we, if we clearly understand that we are, how is thinking I am Brahman an aid? Because once, once we are firmly convinced that we are Brahman, we will then understand, oh, if I'm Brahman, then I need to know what, who am I? I need not think about Brahman. So in that sense, it's an aid. But, uh, uh, but is it inquiry? Is it vichara? Is it investigation? So the implication is merely thinking, I am not this body, I am that. That is not vichara, as he implies here in the 16th paragraph also. Uh, vichara is only fixing the mind on ourselves, only... To, turning the mind within to investigate and see what we, what we actually are. From where this ego rises, uh, that is vichara. Um, merely thinking, I'm not this body, I am that Brahman, though that can indirectly be an aid, is it, in, is it in, uh, vichara? This is a rhetorical question. When he says, I do vichara mama, can it be, uh, or is it uh, investigation? The, impl the, the, the implication is, no, this is not investigation. So that's verse 29. And then verse um, 32, as I say, that's the, the verse in which Bhagavan says, um, when the Vedas proclaim that is you, instead of oneself being, knowing oneself as what? In other words, instead of... It, knowing oneself, knowing and being oneself by investigating what am I, thinking I am that, not this, is due to non-existence of strength, because that alone is always seated as oneself. That is, when we are always that, why should we be constantly thinking I am that? It, it's only lack, it shows a lack, though in verse 29, and again in verse 36, he says it's an aid. Here he says, it is, it's an aid, but an aid for whom? Only for those who lack, who, who are completely lacking in strength, those who don't have the strength of bhakti and vairagya, but is required in order to turn within. So Bhagavan doesn't at all um, recommend this practice 
of uh, thinking I am this. I I I I am this. Uh, I am Brahman. I am not this body, uh, or anything like that. I some some people um, think I am consciousness. I am the self. This is not what Bhagavan recommended. According to Bhagavan, okay, it may be an aid, but it is due to lack of strength. So it's only for it's only for immature aspirants. But such practices are. Uh, 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 so, so, sometimes seem to be prescribed, but Bhagavan would never prescribe such practices. And then in um, the fourth verse in Uludunapdu, where Bhagavan refers to this practice, is verse 36, the practice of thinking I am Brahma. He says, if we think that we are a body, thinking, no, we are that, uh, will be just a good aid for us to stand as that. Since we are always, since we always stand as that, why thinking we are that? Does one think I am a man? What that implies is, if we think we are a body, thinking, no, we are not this body, we are that, Brahman, will be, a, will be just a good aid. He says, um, uh, Nal tuneyeya, tuneyeya, that means it, 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 it's just an aid. It's no more than an aid. Um, uh, though he calls it a good aid, um, it is just an aid. It is just a good aid. It's no more than that. Um, then in, in, what he implies in the next sentence is, um, however, since we always stand or exist as that, why should we be constantly thinking uh, we are that. Uh, does one think that I am a man? That is, we, when we get up in the morning, do we, do we have to think to ourselves, oh, now I must remember, I am a human being. I'm not a dog. I'm not a cat. I'm not a horse. I'm not a cow. I'm a human being. We, we know very well what we are. We know we are, that our experience now is I am a human being. So we don't need to be meditating I am a human being. So uh, so why why don't we need to meditate? I'm a human being. I'm not a cat or a dog or anything because we don't mistake ourselves to be a cat or a dog. We, we we know very clearly we are human. That of course uh, Bhagavan is using that as an analogy. So if we knew ourselves as Brahman, we wouldn't be thinking I am Brahman. If we're thinking I am Brahman, that shows that we don't know ourselves as Brahman. So it it's only for uh, it's only for those who who. Who, uh, who have difficulty grasping the basic fact that we are not this body, if we've understood that we are not this body, we are Brahman, then what should we do? We shouldn't go on thinking, I'm not this body, I'm Brahman. The very fact that we go on thinking, I'm not this body, I am Brahman, shows that we still are not convinced that we are Brahman. If we are really convinced that we are Brahman and not this body, we should just attend to ourselves. We should investigate ourselves. So uh, Bhagavan, as it's clear from these verses and also from this paragraph, Bhagavan does not recommend this practice of Soham Bhavana, of, of, of thinking ourselves to be Brahman. Because who, who can do this practice of thinking I am Brahman? It is only ego. Ego is always aware of itself as I am this person. So if I begin to, to think I am Brahman, um, it, it, it's just going to boost my ego. There's, um, there's a Sanskrit work by Lakshman Sharma called um, Guru Ramla Vachana Mala. Most of the verses in that are Sanskrit translations of verses from Guru Vachika Kovai, but some of them are, are not in Guru Vachika Kovai. They are uh, things that Lakshman Sharma heard Bhagavan saying. And one of the things he records there is Bhagavan saying that this ego or the egotistical person does so much harm thinking I am this body, I am this body, I am this person. If if this ego begins to think I am Brahman, what is there that it will not be, but it will hesitate to do. So so long as we are aware of ourselves as I am Michael or I am whoever, it is it, it is just it's not helping us by thinking I am Brahman because that doesn't get rid of the fundamental error of mistaking myself to be Michael. So long as I'm aware of myself as Michael, I'm not aware of myself as Brahman. However much I may think I am Brahman, 
that doesn't make me Brahman. In order to experience myself as Brahman, I need to investigate myself and see what I actually am. How can I investigate myself? By always keeping my mind fixed on oneself, as Bhagavan says in the previous sentence. Um, so uh, this again, uh, here, uh, what, the, the context in which Bhagavan says this, we need to understand, because, we need to understand the, the context in which Bhagavan has written this paragraph is because in, there is such a prevalent misunderstanding that merely, um, merely studying the text and thinking that we are not this body, but we are Brahman, but this is the way to know ourselves. Bhagavan is, is, is emphatically condemning this. If we want to know ourselves, we need to investigate ourselves. And investigating ourselves, Atmavichara, means just keeping our mind fixed on ourselves. It does not mean um, thinking, I am not this, I am that. That is not Atmavichara. Atmavichara is only keeping our mind fixed on ourselves. Because the thought, I am not this body, I am Brahman, that is a thought. Thoughts are other than ourselves. We shouldn't be attending to any thought, we should be attending to ourselves. Um, so, so that is why Bhagavan has said this. And then finally, he concludes this paragraph, because uh, this paragraph, he's talking about the futility of endless studying, of endless uh, going on studying and um, thinking about uh, numerous books. He, he's, he, he ends this paragraph by reminding us, Katrave uh, anateyum, Orukalatil Maraka Vendi Varum. At one time, it will become necessary uh, to forget all that one has learned. Now we, now we, 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 in this lifetime, we may study so many books. We may be a master of so many different philosophies, or we may, we may be a, um, we may be a great academic, a great pundit, a great scholar having studied so many texts and knowing so many different philosophies and everything. <laughs> but we're going to, every night when we fall asleep, we have to forget all this. And when death comes, we have to forget it permanently. We can't, all that we learn in this lifetime, we can't take over to the next lifetime. All we can take over is the same vasana, the same inclination to go on studying and studying and studying. So merely, whatever we learn, we have to forget. Whatever, because learning comes. Whatever comes, as Bhagavan often said, whatever comes has to go. So we cannot know what we actually are by studying uh, books, by, uh, by however learned we may be, it's all useless if we don't know ourselves. If we know ourselves, there's no need to know anything else because there's nothing else to know when we know ourselves. Bhagavan says it very beautifully in um, Anma Vidde, third verse of uh, Anma Vidde. Bhagavan says, Tanai Aridal Indri, Pinne Edu Arihil En. That means without knowing oneself, if one knows whatever else, what? That, that, is, that, that implies um, that there's no, there's no use in knowing everything else. If one, with, without knowing oneself, there's no use in knowing anything else. However learned we may be, it, it, all our learning is useless if we don't know ourselves. And, and then in the next sentence he says, Tane uh, arindidil pinne enne uludu aria. If one has known oneself, then what else, ex what, what exists to know? That implies when we know ourselves as we actually are, there's nothing else for us to know because we, we alone know what is real. When we know ourselves, we alone exist. So there's nothing else for us to know. So it, learning is, if, if our learning doesn't help us to turn our t attention back towards ourselves, it is useless. If we, if, if we, however, if we don't know ourselves, however much we've learned, it's of no use. If we do know ourselves, there's nothing for us to n learn because what it, what it, when we know what we actually are, we will know that we alone exist. There is nothing else to be known. This is what the Bhagavan says in Upadesha India in the twenty seventh verse of Upadesha India. Bhagavan says. Arivu ariyameyum atra arive arivahum. The, the awareness that is uh, devoid of awareness and ignorance 
its awareness. What he means by that is the, the pure awareness, which is devoid of awareness or ignorance of anything other than ourselves, that alone is real awareness. Uh, idu, uh, this is the truth. This is the reality. Why? I mean, he ends by saying, Arivada ku ondrile. There is nothing for knowing. In other words, there's nothing to be known. If we know what we actually are, there's nothing else to know. So wh why, why is true awareness devoid of awareness and ignorance? Awareness and ignorance means awareness and ignorance of things other than ourselves. If things other than ourselves existed, then being a knowing them or not no, knowing them would be real knowledge. But since they do not exist, knowing them is not real knowledge, it's just ignorance. Knowing ourself alone is true knowledge, according to Bhagavan. And uh, not only is true, uh, 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 true awareness devoid of knowledge of other things, it's also void of ignorance of other things. Why? Because we can be ignorant of, of other things, only if there are other things to be ignorant of. But when we know ourselves as we actually are, there's nothing else to be known. So that's why he ends this, this, um, uh, this paragraph saying, at one time it will be necessary to forget all that one has learned. When ego is, who is the one who learns everything? It is ego. Ego ceases to exist temporarily every day when we fall asleep. And when ego is separated from, uh, when, when this body dies, all that we've learned in this lifetime will be forgotten. And ultimately, when ego itself dies, there'll be no one left to have, that is, what has learned everything is only ego. When ego dies, there no learning remains. Right? Everything is forgotten. And what remains is what always exists and always shines, namely, I am. That alone is the reality. That alone is Bhagavan. That alone is what we actually are. So Bhagavan's teaching from beginning to end, what Bhagavan is emphasizing is that we should seek to know what we actually are. What we actually are is just that fundamental awareness of our own existence, our, I am. We are not this or that. We are just, I am I, as Bhagavan sometimes expressed it. We are nothing other than ourself. So to know ourself, we need to investigate ourselves. And how can we investigate ourselves? Only by keeping our attention fixed on ourselves, keeping the mind fixed on oneself. This alone is, is vichara. So Studying texts is useful to a limited extent because these, if these texts are pointing us back at ourselves, uh, to, to, to emphasizing the need for us to know ourselves as Bhagavan's texts are, then those texts are, are useful. But we shouldn't be going on and on studying them uh, endlessly. That is, we, 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 why do we study Bhagavan's teachings? Why do we think about Bhagavan's teachings? Because they point to us in what we need to know, and they encourage us to seek to know that. In other words, Bhagavan's teaching, firstly, they point out the path very clearly, and they encourage us to follow that path. So, so long as we're following this path, Bhagavan's teachings are a great support. But we shouldn't just go on studying uh, either his books or any other books. We shouldn't go on studying endlessly. Uh, the, the, the purpose, what is the purpose of, 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 of studying Bhagavan's teachings and understanding them or studying any Advaita philosophy and understanding it? It is only to, to, uh, to understand that in order to know ourselves, we need to investigate ourselves. And uh, by, by often uh, dwelling on his teaching, if if we because though we are trying to attend to ourselves, though we are trying to put this into practice, because we still have strong vishaya vasanas, we often are swayed by our vishaya vasanas. So our attention is coming out to dwell on things other than ourselves. When our attention comes outwards, Bhagavan's teachings are a great support, encouraging us to go back within. So uh, our Unfortunately for us, Bhagavan has actually written very, very little. He has all the core principles, everything that we need to know, he's written in just a few, very few texts. Uludunapdu, Pradeshundya, Nana, Ekamapanchakam, Amavidde, Arunachastuti Panchakam, 
but note he wrote for his mother in just a few texts. He has given us all that we need to know. If we understand these texts, nothing else is necessary. All we need, or the only other thing that is necessary is to put it into practice. And whenever we, whenever our enthusiasm put to put it into practice wanes, then we go back to the text to get uh, further encouragement to go back within again. So our aim is, as he says in this, um, in, in this sentence where he defines what is meant by Atmavichara, the name Atmavichara refers only to the practice of always keeping the mind fixed on oneself. So our aim should be always to be self-attentive. That is the purpose of all this. If we don't take to this practice of self-attentiveness, if we don't persevere in this practice of self-attentiveness, we are not deriving the true benefit which is to be gained either from Bhagavan's teachings or from any Advaita teaching. The whole purpose of Advaita is, the whole philosophy of Advaita is point, if we understand it correctly, is pointing out the need for us to know ourselves. How can we know ourselves? Only by attending to ourselves, only by always keeping our mind fixed on ourselves. So this is what Bhagavan is emphasizing in this. Our aim is not just to go on and on studying these books. Our aim is to know what we actually are. We can know what we actually are only by turning within and investigating ourselves, by keeping our mind fixed on ourselves. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arunachala Ramanaya.